Welcome to the Dividend Talk Podcast, episode 195. Dividend growth stocks from every sector. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just getting started, Dividend Talk is the place to be for insights, analysis, and unsorted advice on how to make the most of your money through dividends with our own unique European flavor. I'm your co-host, Engineer My Freedom, and today I am joined by European DGI. So sit back, relax, and join us as we dive into the world of dividend investing and discover the power of passive income. Hey, European DJI. How are you, my friend? Uh, hey, the almost weekend, new opportunities. The stock market has been doing me really well. I don't know how it was by you, but you know, usually I don't pay too much attention to it, but I had to be two times this week on my portfolio tracker. And I felt like, is there something wrong with the calculations? Be- because the value of my co- uh, portfolio just continues to go up and I'm a bit confused. So I was thinking like, ah, oh, is the, the euro dollar value is, uh, really sharply uh, declining because often when for instance the dollar gets stronger at parity or something like that it would be like a few percent uh, in, uh, improvement and that has a has also some impact on my portfolio right but no nothing of that and 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 I was okay never mind and then I looked at it again today because I had to add some dividends and I think yeah, what the fuck it's up again with a few thousand yeah and you know, a few thousand is, is maybe uh, let's say one or two percent of so or so on my portfolio, right? But one or two percent move in my portfolio is a lot. Yeah, is is a lot when you're so well diversified. And I mean, not maybe well diversified from a technical point of view, but just the amount of stocks you have. Yeah. And then I started looking, and I think like, oh, Ahold went to twenty nine euro. I, I I bought some uh, Hershey the other day. It went back to two hundred five dollars. Um, then I'm I'm looking at um, a Shell that is now at uh, thirty four uh, euros or something like that. Then I look at Microsoft, and those are all my top positions. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think like, okay, so now I know what's happening in my portfolio. My my top positions like Shell, Microsoft, Ahold. Uh, this is all top five, yeah. They and and also even uh, Apfi, you could argue, they have been all increasing quite a bit in value this um, uh, this week, yeah. And now and now I understand why I'm <laughs> why I was watching in my portfolio and what's happening there. It's interesting, right? Because I usually don't pay so much value, uh, attention to this, but you know the the, the numbers is, is in my eyes there, and I think like, what the fuck is happening here? Because I usually don't get so happy with this because if it goes up, I think like shit, it becomes more difficult to buy stocks again. Yeah. So anyway, that's uh, off my chest now. Um, this this the awkward thing. Us as investors here, when we're in the accumulation phase, we want to see our portfolio go down, but in this case, it just continued to go up for what it's worth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I I get that same feeling this week. I was looking at it yesterday. CRH, I mentioned them when since they moved to America, they have been on fire. Um, their share price is nearly nearly doubled, over doubled for me. Actually, it's it's I, I kind of kicked myself. I didn't I didn't buy a whole lot more at the time. Um, but yes, CRH, BlackRock, NN Group are flying uh, flying at the moment. So. Wow, wow! And then the CRH is just it's just cement producer. <laughs> yeah, concrete, just the concrete. They, they just take scent and they sell, uh, package it and sell it to others. <laughs> <laughs> they sell sand to the Arabs. That's the same we used to have. <laughs> uh, well, um, it's a business uh, model, <laughs> of course, of course. So we have we have quite a bit of news actually this week, and I thought the first one might interest you a little bit because I know you've spoken about it um, a little bit before you touched on it, but. Will Google ever have a competitor, especially with this AI boom that we are in the middle of? And it looks like they will because Open AI, they have pre-announced some plans that they have some big news. So there's a lot of whispers going around. There's a lot of speculation. They have refused to comment on what it is. Mm-hmm. 
but a lot of people are expecting that it will release an artificial intelligence powered search product on Monday coming, which is quite interesting, I would wow. say. This will be very interesting. And let's see, let's see. I mean, I'm 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 a bit uh how is it? I, I own some Google, right? Yeah. And I have a feeling that Google was late with the cloud. I think they are doing really well now with the cloud, yeah, picking up, but it took them much, much longer than Microsoft or, or someone like that to figure it out how to have a product that actually earns money uh, for them, decent money, right? Yeah. And I was the other time also think, looking at search and what I recently noticed in search, it's all the time Reddit in the top and everything. And we know that Google took a st stake in Reddit, yeah? And, and, and YouTube. And I have a feeling that they are prior prioritizing at the moment mostly their revenue because because their their ads uh, revenue was growing again, but yeah, if you if you point it to all of this, you're, you're filling your own pockets, of course, right? Because then you send it to YouTube, and on YouTube you have ads again. Um, and what I also so that's one. So I, I I start to have an issue sometimes with search relevance because I don't need to know someone uh, anonymous person on Reddit uh, the opinion. Yeah, I want to have some more concrete yeah. data. Yeah, and. At the same time, I, I, I find myself uh, using ChatGPT a lot for search questions. Yeah, uh, already, like what, what I used to go for, uh, to for um, uh, Google in the past. So I spent less time on Google as a search engine. Yeah. So I, I, and sometimes you see this with companies that the decline has already started, but we get fooled as investors because they are still maximizing the profit out of it. While the decline already started, so I I need to think some I need to think one time a little bit deeper uh, about Google. I mean, it's a powerhouse. It is YouTube, of course, right? But the execution with the new product launches, yeah, I don't know. And then I see OpenAI. So I'm very curious. I mean, I think the world will be better off with a uh, strong competitor in the search space. That's yeah. for sure. And this is this is very classic. If um, it shows that some companies have a very low uh, moat, of course, everyone thinks about Google as having a strong moat because dominating the the brand of search. But we should not forget it's a technology company. The moment a better technology is there, um, the network effect may not be so strong anymore because people will be curious. If there is su such a delta and added value to jump to the next big thing, and then you can lose your client base all overnight because then the network effect starts to become very strong on the other product. Yeah. That's the issue with tech stocks. Yeah, so it can go well for a decade, and and usually if it's around the periphery of the same technology, then usually you, the network effect keeps keeps everything together. But when there is really like a, a new technology. Um, like adding so much new value, yeah, that's the moment that a company's uh, core product can be gone overnight. Yeah, so I'm, I'm very interesting. It, it's 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 a becoming a battle of the giants soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, it just triggered me about my own search habits now, and I'm not using ChatGPT. I, I don't really like it to be honest with you, but I use Copilot in Bing quite a lot yeah. actually because you ask it a question, it yeah. will give you an answer, but also links to the relevant websites and it's not just yeah. the, the, exactly it's not just the reddit's the youtubes it's actually yeah. links to what you want and it's, i actually find it really really and, good and you're right i use copilot also much more i mean i i actually started using bing because of that uh some a while ago now bing is my standard browser it does well and so i often search in there and then copilot is the answer uh, that i get yeah so yeah, I know the search uh, share market share doesn't look like how we are discussing it now. Uh, yet it, it's it's clear that Google is dominating, which you know, uh, empires like Rome they 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 were very strong for a long time, and uh, we could have some popcorn and fireworks, right? Maybe how do you say it? In the Netherlands, we say the the mother is the wens der gedachte. So maybe I, I, my hope is just there that we see some fireworks in this space. <laughs> it's anyway a small position for me, Google. But I, I I mean this is this is nice to see a technology coming, a disruptor coming. Um, you know, and either way I win because yeah. I own Microsoft quite yeah. significantly. So yeah, this is just popcorn time. It's very interesting to see how this is going. 
Um, another piece of news then that I, I thought was interesting was Intel. Um, they kind of released a statement saying that their sales are take hit. There's obviously more argy bargy between China and the US. I know Biden came out there yesterday or the day before talking about solar panels and there's, there's a lot going on, isn't it? There? There's a lot going on between the two companies. And yeah. It looks like Intel are going to take a hit now on some of their revenue, which is obviously not good news for them. No, Intel is really now in a difficult situation because uh, they're struggling with execution. Yeah, I still think that Pat gets it, uh, Pat Gelsinger. But the former CEO, Bob Swan, screwed it up so much with with the lack of focus on technology, right? And look at where they are now. Uh, you may even start wondering, like, at what time Intel is beyond repair? Yeah. It, it's starting to look... It's starting well, to look you know, but you, you, then then when I, I, I pay a bit of attention to this because I find it just very intriguing. And then I le- read customer reviews about some of their new chips and they're pretty solid, yeah? Pretty solid. So, but... Yeah, it's just very hard to turn the ship around when you have AMD and NVIDIA that are just dominating and on fire. Yeah, so, I mean, I really hope that Intel does it. Uh, it's an iconic company. Uh, and by the way, it still powers the world. Yeah, if you think about all the laptops, most of them have an Intel in there. Yeah, so, but to get back into the data centers and to be dominating there, that that's where they, that's a yeah, tough one. Yeah, tough one. Yeah, I w- We'll see. But it's just a lot going on between those two countries, and look, there'll be yeah. knock-on effects as well the, the yeah. other way. So it's something to be aware of. Um, what about Solventum? We were wor- we were wondering, will this dividend reset from 3M? Will it be? An and action? they will not pay a dividend in the first yeah. two years, right? They want to focus on paying down the debt. So it's an ordinary dividend cut that 3M did. Yeah, really. I mean, the way they are packaging it. I mean, I. This is like a loser's mentality of a CEO. Just watch your shareholders in the eyes and say, guys, we need to cut the dividends. Yeah. Uh, we and 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 then say, like, yes, we did a spin-off and don't count on Solventum. They know this stuff already. I know they let it be announced by Solventum a week later, but don't bull- bullshit around. Yeah. Don't bullshit around. Just say it. Um, management could do better here in the communication around this. I know they they said reset. They I know they said forty percent of uh, um, uh, uh, post uh, solvent to spin off free cash flow. Why why let us do all the math? Just tell us. Yeah, yeah. just tell us if you're already at that stage. Just tell us. Make it easy. Make it easy for the Joe Soap out here. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, look, it's it's a full on dividend cut now, and I, I would imagine anyone who was thinking about holding on to Solventum, yeah, will will reconsider that now. But. Yeah, and I I think I look at Solventum's earnings, and it is really a slow growing business. Yeah, so yeah, let's let's not have too much uh, hope on that one. Yeah, slow growing with a lot of debt, yeah. not an not an ideal scenario. And then the last news of the week goes to Mackey D's, McDonald's. Um, there's a whole lot of hullabaloo about this $5 value meal that they're going to offer. This is interesting, right? I don't know what your thoughts are, but it's really interesting. Like they've been hiking the shit uh, out, of their, um, out of their meals from a price point of view you know, uh, surfing the wave of inflation. And now they are surprised that people start finding it too expensive. They know what uh, group they are uh, serving. Yeah. Yeah, There are many people that go to McDonald's not because they necessarily want to, but also out of necessity. Yeah. 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 It's interesting. Let's see if that follows through throughout europe as well because this is five dollars so this is the us market um I, I don't know how much it costs i don't go to mcdonald's or over here i'm not yeah. particularly a fan uh, we have our own brand supermax over well here it's really hard in poland to get a proper meal for uh, five five dollars or five mm-hmm. euros um uh, if you do like such a combo discount offer yes maybe yes but um Otherwise, you also pay like seven, eight euros uh, nowadays. Yeah. So, 
I, I'm just wondering, like uh, Starbucks CEO said that they didn't communicate the value well enough. Well, they now also have a value coffee or something like that. Uh, so they, you know, not ask five five euro uh, for I don't know for a cappuccino, but then they say like we give you a value deal for I don't know three euro. You know, yeah. just just uh, twice as small. I don't know, like a baby chino. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll we'll see. But obviously, there's been talks recession. We didn't quite get into recession, but I think the effects are are still there. There's like there's if these companies uh, feel it, then there's something going on there in America yeah. because this is Starbucks as well, right? It was the U.S. business and China uh, mostly. So the. It, it just means that people at the moment can't easily afford it. I saw a chart the other day as well where it showed that from before COVID, um, you know, the the families in America had no savings really. Then during COVID, savings went skyrocketed also with the uh, the money that they got from the government. And now they are back to square one again. But prices are also very high at the moment. So... It, um, I think uh, we're going to get an, um, an I said a consumer re recession. That, that's kind of, if you if you read the signals here and there, um, and you see in the companies effectively complaining about this. Maybe this time they really start to, uh, yeah, that the consumers really start to feel it. Yeah, yeah. Um, dividend hikes. We haven't had many of note. Um, there's been a few yeah. last week, but Simon Property. Hike the dividend by 2.6 percent that's actually their second hike uh, within 12 months and it is a total of a 5.3 increase in that time this is one of those uh, stocks that i don't have in my portfolio that i never was really interested in even while dividend day uh, was not anymore with us let's say uh was was pitching it to us and everything and where you a few years later really learn like damn you know you can have a proper business in the retail space uh, here when it comes to real estate investment uh, trusts. So yeah, chapeau to management to continue uh, with such a good balance sheet uh, to reward shareholders with uh, increasing dividends. Chapeau. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the main topic today is inspired by Tim, who last week asked us to pick one company each from the eleven sectors. So here we go. We we we'll go with. 11 sectors will start with healthcare. What do you pick? Uh, up fee. So, first of all, why not Johnson & Johnson? Yeah, I was reflecting on that and I thought like, if I look at my portfolio, uh, and because I went through my portfolio and I thought like, you know what? Up fee has been the dark horse here. No, it doesn't have a triple A balance sheet like uh, Johnson Johnson. But look at the performance over the years. And how they have been uh, managing their pipeline now with um, uh, what's go again, Rinvork and Skirici, uh, the Allergen acquisition, now the latest acquisition again, uh, how they have been focused on paying down debt, how the cash flow is being managed. I thought, like, you know what? Upfi has, has excellent management. Now, that was my reason for choosing Upfi. Uh, I yeah. think Johnson Johnson is probably still like from a stability point of view balance sheet, maybe the best, but Upfi excites me more uh, when I look at it. Yeah, I mean, when you think back to pre-COVID, maybe 2019, how much of a bargain they were trading at because that paid. I bought them then around sixty uh, between yeah. sixty and seventy dollars. Yeah. Even under a hundred dollars, they were they were a bargain yeah. at at that time. The paint cliff was was coming up, so it was. Um, Management have done a fantastic job, fantastic yes. job over over that time. Um, look, we we know I struggle with healthcare with the pipelines and stuff, but I kind of stuck with a European company here. I stuck with Sanofi. Um, they are a market leader in insulin, which I know the prices of insulin is dropping, which is affecting them heavily. Um, they also have the drug, which is the main driver actually with Regeneron. Um, it's an eczema drug called Dupix Ent, is it? Mm -hmm. Dupix Ent, du yeah. Dupix Ent. Yeah. And then, uh, and then, obviously, then they've been trying to acquire companies. So the latest one is Prevention Bio, which gives them qu quite big exposure, actually, to the diabetes market. I think um, the latest drug got approved, and that will go to market as well. So, I mean, the three 
big areas. You've got insulin, you've got diabetes and eczema, which I think are three pretty big markets. They've got a, they're relatively cheap. They've got a 16 PE ratio, a 70 dividend safety on our own algorithm, a decent balance sheet and pay ratio. So I kind of stuck, stuck European. They're not without their problems. And we know growth and we know that pipeline is not as strong. So they're going to have to try and buy our way into some, some growth, which, which they're trying to do. But I think they have a decent yield of 4%. Not as safe as your Johnson and Johnson's and not as well managed as Abvi. I think it's a solid European choice. Nice, nice one, nice one. Yeah, Sanofi. Um, I've been looking so often in it in the past, um, and they just won the jackpot with Tuxipend, right? That's it. They just won the jackpot. So nice one, nice pick. So um, let's go then to the second sector in uh, materials. Anything that comes to mind for you in the materials sector? Uh, it's 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 a sector that I I don't look at too often purely because the cyclicality of it i know i, I had rio tinto for a little bit you, you kind of want to buy them when it's it's quite cheap because you know eventually you'll get those high dividends but yeah I, I mean if i was to push it would be rio tinto but purely on the basis that you're going to get a high dividend yield it's going to be quite cyclical you can't rely on, on it for income but if i was pushed it's probably the only one that i know a little bit about so I, I would go rio tinto but definitely um materials is not actually i don't think i have any materials in my portfolio yeah yeah for me the only one that i can consider is bhp i own it already for a very long time it's not a stable stable dividend grower it has been a cash flow machine that's the good thing um but this is probably one of the weakest sectors for me that i don't really need to position in so i've got i by the way own both rio and bhp and high dividend stocks but not dividend growth stocks um, not a lot excites me there i bought them both at the bottom or not at the bottom exactly but uh, in the down cycle yeah yeah i think i think with these types of stocks you nearly have to do what we hate and time the market yeah it's, yeah it's, true it's, it, it's when people are saying that these stocks are dead, they're no good, don't buy them. It's probably a good time yeah. to start buying them. True, true, true. Okay, energy, energy stocks. I think we both went with the same company here, and it's hard to argue against Shell. I mean, we speak about Shell so yeah. often, really Sterling's last week. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, come on, we are biased, we're European. I think if we would have lived in America, we would, we would have said Chevron or ExxonMobil probably. No. Yeah, uh, because they have a higher multiple, also well managed, didn't cut the dividends uh, during COVID. So I, I've I realized I'm fully biased, but if the yellow shell and and how it's been growing lately, recovering, you could say, but we ignore that part, of course. So how it's been growing lately, the it, it's it's for me. Uh, yeah, there must be some European bias there, let's say it like that. But it's a cash flow machine. And you know what's so interesting? The the fact that there's such a strong push from ESG, that pension funds and, and, and such are not buying really Shell anymore. There's such a strong push in ESG, which means that that actually the world need, needs even more energy to get there at the moment that's so interesting right uh, yeah. so which means that i think this this oil price will stay here for some time and at these levels because what happened in 2016 there was the oil oil crisis um companies i don't know had 60 65 dollars in 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 cost per ba cost per barrel they declined that significantly by stopping investments in, in new projects and everything because they were not uh, profitable anymore. They started uh, managing their cost uh, basis better. And, and some of them, they can now produce at $30 per barrel or something like that in certain regions. Yeah, so the cost went lower. The price went back up for the, share, uh, for the, for the oil. And look at the cash flows that are coming in. So, and Shell is an example of that as well. And and with their transition into gas, yeah, yeah. I I, I was just going to say it's so, it's so funny you're talking about Shell as just an oil company, but the gas is just exactly just, just as big, just as profitable. Yeah. If 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 oil is on its way out, gas is, is still sticking around. Exactly. So, 
it's such a, a well-managed company and i think i like the fact and i mentioned this last week i like the fact that they were going down this renewable route for a little bit but they went mm, yeah we're not going to make as much money off that let's park that i'll i'll is here to stay <laughs> so i and i mean i i prefer that strategy if, if i'm honest with you me too me too okay consumer discretionary um i might go first on this one it's a company i don't think i've spoke about on this podcast before i don't know if you heard of them um but they are ipar perfumes um so they obviously do fragrances perfumes so you've heard of guess um which is yes. a really big one that they have so they have like their, their growth is phenomenal um they have about 20 percent dividend growth over the last couple of years the revenues are off the scale i think this quarter was the first quarter of every year is usually their slowest after after a busy christmas period you have the stocking you have all these sorts of things and um, michael kors is another big one that they have mm-hmm. so i think this quarter they got hammered quite a bit because they've released released quite a few number of fragrances and what happens when they do that is that obviously stores will have their own fragrances so they have to sell them and destock them before they buy the new inventory and that takes it takes quite a while to bed in. So what you'll see happening is over the next quarter, it'll start to pick up. And then by the third and fourth quarter, it will it really start to take off. And wow. you'll see the benefit of that. So the share price dropped a couple of percent. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it did drop because of this. But it's it's not unexpected. Um, but the growth, the growth is still there. And they have a really good, really good solid dividend history. I think it's at a 3% yield right now, which is okay. quite high. Quite yeah. high for them. Usually it's around the 1%. Yeah. Um, so it's it's an interesting company. You should check it out. Obviously, it, it's cyclical. It's it's perfumes, um, and they can go in and out of fashion quite quite easily. But they have all the big brands, and it's it's the one to one to look at. So when will you make a dividend stock card for those for them? Uh, soon. You should. Yeah, soon. You should. Okay. Super. Okay, it's a nice one, and uh, we never discussed that one indeed. So interesting, interesting. And, we'll, and maybe to the listeners, we'll make sure the tickers are in the in the show notes on uh, Spotify and such. Yeah. So my my pick, and it's funny we are discussing quite a bit European here when we go across the sectors, but it has to be L'Oreal. I mean, I did a deep dive on this company, and. Um, it, it it's just I mean it was doubting between Louis Vuitton and 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 L'Oreal, but I had to choose L'Oreal. Um, when I thought about it, Louis Vuitton is a little bit more fashion from that point of view. So it's the devil's choice, but yeah, L'Oreal for me. I mean, both Fran- both from France, but I think this company. I mean, just the lipstick. I guess that what uh, pulled me over, but. Because you have the other ones like in America and such, and then I think about this. Nah, yeah. Because what for, what is for me important is also brand power, and L'Oreal has a lot of brand powers and 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 the and the other brands that they own, right? So, yeah, L'Oreal. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough choice. If I if I had it gone to my head, I'd I'd probably go with Louis Vuitton, a little bit more diversified across yeah. different sectors. But I mean, it's hard to argue. Two two excellent French companies, um, I have to say. That's the second French company of the day, actually, after Sanofi. France are doing. Who would have ever guess, guessed that? <laughs> France are doing quite well. Um, consumer staples, then, and actually, I'm quite interested because I was expecting, I was expecting something else from you. Um, but go on, give me your pick. Yes, yeah, so I mentioned Hershey. Yes, you um, did. I, I was thinking uh, about it uh, deeply. I think Hershey, in the consumer staples sector, as one of the best governance in place. So what people, what many people don't know is that Hershey has also the Hershey Foundation, I believe it's called. Yes. And they own uh, effectively decision power on the Hershey company. And the Hershey Foundation is, again, I think, I'm, I'm doing this from, from, my, from my mind without having um, uh, prepared for it, but I believe they are having like a, a school for orphanage as well. And they depend on the dividend income, so they do a lot of uh, charity uh, welfare. So they need a growing dividend. So our incentives are so much aligned. And then if you look at the business model, it's about chocolate. Um, they have strong ba- brand power with the Hershey uh, brand, the Hershey Bites, and such. Uh, of course, more in the states than in, in international, but that, that's also where a little bit of opportunity is. 
the company has been just compounding over the years and i felt like this stability and 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 this uh, shareholder structure i find it a bit of more quality than the one that you were thinking about that's koninklijke ahol del Heze. when i think about koninklijke ahol del Heze, you know i love this company as well yeah and um it's a combination of dividends and buybacks but i would still think that the dividend if you think over the next 30 years, I think the Hershey dividend is more safe than the Ahold dividend uh, because of the shareholder structure. And yeah. that was the main difference why I chose uh, one of the uh, one of the two. But I mean, the, come on, I was talking with someone today who was ordering every day um, uh, things from Albert Heijn and I was I was thanking thanking him. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that hey, that shareholder structure looks quite interesting with Hershey. It's quite similar to Carlsberg. You know, I did a deep dive mm -hmm. on Carlsberg. Yeah. Where they had Carlsberg Foundation, and they also yeah. use the income of that uh, not for charity as such, but more for research and 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 so on. So it's it's, it's yeah. quite an interesting business model in terms of you know that if they rely on the dividend income, yeah. they're not going to cut that without a real real reason to do so. So. And I quickly looked it up. It's the Milton Hershey School Trust, and they are currently the sh largest shareholder with 29% of shares outstanding. And I remember that Mondelez wanted to buy um, Hershey, and they blocked it, yeah, uh, because of the Milton uh, Hershey Foundation, let's say. They blocked it. And yeah, so it's also kind of that there's a. Um, a defense mechanism in place towards, um, I said, uh, e evil takeover uh, approaches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is which is quite good to have as a. Yeah. Um, so I went with I quite went European again. I I'm going European quite a bit, but I went with British American tobacco, and I Oof. put this I put this in as a high yielder uh, option in this. Um, space because um, I don't think we've we've had many high yielders. Um, yeah. Materials can be classed as high yield, but British American tobacco. Look, the share price is under pressure. Tobacco is obviously out of favor, um, so there's a lot of headwinds against it in terms of share price. But I mean, I think it's a fantastically run company. I think the dividend is as safe as you can expect with a ten percenter. There's always that risk, obviously, once once you get to those high levels. But listening. To the, I haven't I haven't actually listened to this quarter, but listened to the quarter mm -hmm. before. They were quite confident in in that dividend. They're quite confident in the growth in these heated products that they're releasing to the market. So I think it's I think it's as, as safe a ten percent as you can expect. I would say. Yes, true, true. That I would say. Interesting one. Nice. I didn't expect that one. I would have thought you would have gone maybe for a more, yeah, boring one like Walmart or. Aldo has or PepsiCo or Coca Cola, and you come with British American tobacco. Very yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. have this feeling always for gambling, like yeah. Fiji and Sin stocks. Yeah. Yeah. Sin stocks. Yeah, 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 yeah. To nurture that, so interesting. And that's for a non-smoker, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't smoke, but I actually, yeah. um, it was so funny. I worked the other day. Some of the guys were into vaping and and smoke, smoking. Yeah. They had their products and stuff. Who says who says that? Who says that? It's a British American tobacco. If not, that's what you need to buy. Um but, <laughs> and was it? No, I know I can't I can't remember what I think it was Philip Morris. Yeah, Philip because Morris. Philip Morris is doing well lately, yeah, from yeah. what I see. Yeah. yeah. Okay, industrials, industrials. Yeah, we we I think we agree here, but it has to be Siemens. I don't know a better industrial that is of such blue chip nature as Siemens. I just don't know it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, there's, there's, there's definitely other options out there. Like Caterpillar could have been there, John Deere yeah. could have been there. Yeah. But I think, as, as, as you said, European Siemens are just uh, f fantastic. They're, they're in everything. I mean, I, I can't think of a company that touches so many aspects and are so big and yet so well managed. It's, it's. Yeah. We look, at, we look at 3M for example. How badly managed they yeah. were when they tried to diversify so much. These guys were in health, they were in wind. General Electric as well, 3M. The Siemens is really outstanding in this case. Yeah. That's also not had the growth like those other companies, no. right? So no. maybe they have really chosen predictable long-term growth over opportunistic management in the short term. 
Yeah, I mean, it, which, which has done itself many, many yeah. favors. But maybe they would have had that grow. I mean, they've spun off so many parts of that. Oh, that's true. As well. yeah. So they've spun off all those parts. So I think it's a fantastic company. Siemens, I mean, I spoke about them when they were under 100. I should have backed up the truck then. I should have backed up the truck. Who knows? Uh, Maybe we'll get a chance again because uh, in the end, these are cyclical stocks. Yeah, of course. Of course. Utilities. Good. Utilities. It's a, hard, yes. it's a hard one, isn't it? It was a hard one because I'm usually not interested in the utilities. Um, I burnt my fingers in the past a little bit on utilities, uh, specifically the US ones. They often have very much depth and, you know, they are they are hard specifically when you don't understand the american infrastructure and such because we don't live there yeah um that's why i really had to go with ibertrola i mean i did a deep dive on it i, I feel like i understand this uh, company much better yeah. um so ibertrola it, it just is for um yeah i don't remember which newsletter version it was um, I initiated a position also when it got in my fair value zone there and happy to own it. And yeah, they continue growing. Yeah, like, I feel like a company like American Water could fit in a portfolio like mm, this. Uh, yeah, I, probably. I know, I know we've heard about them quite a bit on the show. I think they increased the dividend by 8%. Over, yeah, but I could only pick them if I would knew them well enough. Yeah, exactly. That's my issue. Exactly, and and I was in a similar situation thinking about it, so I cheated a little bit. I picked UK Wind, who are not really a utility, but they're in that kind of space. They do yeah. wind, they do wind farms. Um, so I stuck with Green Co UK Wind, and I look. I've spoke about them quite a bit. I've done a deep dive yeah. on them as well. Um, they tend to increase the dividend at the rate of inflation, so the higher the inflation in terms of um, in terms of dividend for these guys is normally a good thing. So. Nice. Sorry. Financials. And it was so funny, actually. I was watching you type live. Um, we weren't yeah. chatting, but I could see you typing. You were like typing in a name, you deleted it, you type it in another name, you deleted it, and you finally settled on, on your selection. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It has to be Munich RE. I, I, I honestly I was first thinking about ASR uh, yeah. as an example, but then I felt like, no, I because I felt like, okay, and then group ASR. I feel like okay, SR is better than an N group from quality of management. Yep. And then I feel like, oh, but wait a second, we have Munich RE in Germany. Yeah. And yeah, so it had to be Munich RE. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I think you were typing in Allianz before Munich RE. No, that was supposed to be ASER. Oh, was it? <laughs> yeah. 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 Munich, Munich RE. I think that was one of the first deep dives we've done on the podcast. Yes. Way back in episode two or three or four. It'd be actually um, quite interesting to go back and listen to that and see how our how our thesis played played out mm -hmm. in that time. Um, I picked Black Rock. Um, I was going to pick T. Rowe Price. I was going to pick Blackstone, but I think of all of them, Black Rock are the biggest. They've got a, a solid dividend history, good growth rate, and look, they're not going anywhere. They own half the world. They're, they're investing in pretty much everything. They own shares, they own funds, they own companies. Um, so I think in terms of financial, if you want a safe company, probably someone like BlackRock is is yeah. a good option. Nice. Okay, uh, we have a couple of sectors left. Um, 11 is quite a lot, actually, when you're going through 22 companies, but we've got information technology. Um, I, I mean, look, I don't think anyone, I don't think anyone will not guess your pick here. <sighs> Microsoft. It has to be Microsoft. I mean, if you think about all the technology companies, uh, and, and of course we look at dividend growth stocks here, but look at just all the all the technology stocks. Nvidia, it, it's a powerhouse, but in the end, it's in a kind of a single line of business. Yeah, Google, it is in it, okay. It's in YouTube and 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 search. Yeah. Um, Facebook, a social media network, it does into Instagram, Facebook, but kind of a single line of business. But then go to Microsoft. It's the cloud. It's LinkedIn. It's it's Xbox. It's in the office uh, space, right? The office suite. Um, it, it, it has the whole uh, database space. I mean, it's insane what it all 
all does yeah and now also generative ai with its investments in uh, open ai and its uh, co-pilots uh, so it's also in search i mean th th this is a flywheel i think the the flywheel concept of amazon that jeff bezos talks about i feel that um such an adela brought it to perfection yeah i mean there's nothing that company cannot do at at, at the moment and Honestly, I knew you were going to pick Microsoft, and it's one of the reasons I didn't. I didn't want to pick the same. Uh, yeah. I didn't want to be boring, but it's hard to argue that they are the best information technology company in terms of dividend and growth out there at the moment. Yeah. So, kudos to you. But, I mean, sometimes you fall into the trap with information technology companies and think there's not that many out there. You, you, put type, you try and think of companies like Microsoft, but yeah. actually... The company I picked was Evolution Gaming, but there's other companies out there that, that fall into this niche that yeah. we may not think about. One of them is the company I'm doing a deep dive on in the latest um, newsletter, with, which is Man and Machine is what it, it is in English, but it's yeah. Mensch own Machine or something yeah. um, is the chairman. But I mean, that's in the information technology sector in terms of the products that they offer. They have yeah. software that are computer-aided, drawn-related, and and so on but it's a top class company it's a small cap it's german it's it's european it has a bit of a checker past with dividends but it's mm -hmm. dividend history in the last 10 years has been quite strong particularly in the last five years yeah. since they transformed their business but you you don't think of those companies because you have google you have microsoft you have all these yeah. companies taking over but i went with evolution gaming you've converted me wolf of harcourt has converted me Obviously, it's a niche that I'm interested in. We, you spoke about gambling. You spoke about all this in stock. So it was hard to ignore that for quite a while. And that drop um, two or three weeks ago, mm -hmm. I think it was a, it was a good time to initiate a position in them. So, oh, congrats! Happy. Welcome, uh, my fellow shareholder. I, I am I am part of, part of the club. And actually, my my uh, kind of pushed me as well. My son, he must have been listening to the podcast, but he came to me. He wanted to buy shares in it as well. So he has done. Um, he bought the same amount as me, actually, which is quite funny. Um, and we are but both talking about sin stocks, right? Yeah, this is one as well. Sometimes oh, also on social media, people say like, "Oh, I, I, I could never own Evolution." I understand that because you're supporting gambling here, and it ruins many families. Of course, yeah, of course it does. Um, same as smoking, drinking, lots, lots of things. But it's true. Sin stock, but yeah, just... I killed the mood. Now I know that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a happy shareholder. So, uh, <laughs> ne next one then communication services. What would you pick? <laughs> I love your answer here, but I would go with a ticker called CCOI, so Cognet Communications. I spoke about them once mm -hmm. on the show before. They have a niche offering to target businesses, it's high end broadband. You know what you're getting. With. You know what you're getting with mm -hmm. them. It's not your AT and T. It's not your Verizon. So they have a very niche niche market. The problem with these guys is when you're looking at them, if you use if you use metrics like earnings per share or PE ratios, they always trade at really really high multiples. Um, their earnings fluctuate as you expect, but they generate strong cash flows. They have strong business, stable business, and actually, right, if you look at their dividend growth, they grow it. They increase it every quarter and they've done that for the last 50 50 odd quarters as well now it's only one or two percent but it it all adds up yeah, yeah yeah so so i really have a hard one with this one uh, to think about it um i was thinking maybe kpn in the netherlands yeah but we have also verizon right so Horizon, Orange, you have Orange as well who is just yeah but orange i'm not a fan of uh not a stable dividend grower so I would probably go maybe for Verizon then. Yeah. At least there is dividend growth there. The payout ratio is still relatively decent. Better managed than AT&T. Of course. KPN is doing well off as, as of late. But KPN's history uh, doesn't give me a lot of yeah, uh, yeah. good feelings. Vibes. This give me a little of go, go to five. It may be now good under current management for a few years, and then there will be like a drama again about an uh, I don't know a potential takeover from Mexico, whatever it is. This this market is so hard. So for me, communication services sector, I don't own any positions there. 
and I find it uh, kind of not an interesting uh, sector to even be in. It's it's typically not a safe sector for for dividend growth investors. I, I think AT and T kind of had a fairy tale. They were a dividend aristocrat. I don't know if they were nearly a dividend king, but they had decades of increases, which probably led investors into a false sense of security. AT and T under thirty and all that jazz um, online, but it's a it's a hard it's a hard business for dividend growth. As everything that we don't want, high debt, a lot of capex. Uh, cash flows can can fluctuate from one year to the next, so it's it's. But but maybe uh, maybe uh, because I'm not hundred percent here. But aren't, for instance, uh, Google, Meta, Netflix also part of the communication services? Disney I, is as well, actually. Disney yeah, as well. So yeah. maybe maybe just thinking about telcos, but yeah. Well, Google initiated the met, uh, a dividend in Meta as well. So from the two, I would probably choose uh, Google. Um, but I think still with Verizon, I would I would stick yeah, yeah. in this case. Okay, and then the last last sector is real estate. Yeah, it has to be agree realty for me at this moment in time. I think I mean we discuss so often about it lately. Um, realty incomes, little brother, better debt profile. Uh, and their acquisitions are still contributing meaningfully. So they don't need to acquire entire portfolios somewhere or do these kinds of special deals. They can still like um, just add stores and such where it still makes an impact in their growth. High high quality stores as well. It's 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 yeah. I mean investment grain tenants, nearly seventy yeah. percent of the portfolio. Yeah. Which wasn't in the past, yeah, but they're really following Realty income model, uh, business model here. Yeah, um, and no surprise who who I go for, which is Vici. I spoke about him quite a bit. I'm sticking as a sinner, but I did see something interesting on your Twitter actually, which is from the CEO. Uh, it was a transcript. Yeah, it was from Mirdat on uh, Facebook actually. Mirdat uh, put uh, a really nice. You should read it. Do you have it in front of you? Yeah, I'm reading it now. Yeah, it's quite yeah, funny. Okay, so read it out loud. Read it out okay, loud for us. Surprise. So it says, thank you, Samantha, and good morning, everybody. The first quarter of 2024 was, shall we say, an interesting quarter in the American equity marketplace. A fair part of the S&P 500 packed into, <laughs> packed into a house and held a magnificent party. One Wall Street shop went so far as to say the party reached the rarefied state of euphoria. Euphoria, that sounds kind of fun, but to be clear, American REITs were not invited to this party. <laughs> <laughs> Those of us who work within the REITs were out on the curb outside that party house. From the outside, one could wonder if this was a party in which new monarchs were being coronated for perpetual rule or the kind of party that eventually ended with ambulances and cops being called and a few party goers flee naked down the street out of their minds like Will Ferrell in old school. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. Sure. I mean, this is the CEO of, of a company coming to help with this. I, I mean, I love it. I love this. Yeah, this is the one you want to own shares. And and, and because I reposted this from Mir that, uh, so credits, all credits to Mir that, uh, for calling this out. I reposted it on Twitter and then we had uh, Volodymyr Vayner saying like, the rights, the REITs, uh, real estate sector wasn't invited to the pool market indeed. But rest assured, the real estate investment trust sector will be invited to the beers party directly into the VIP box. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Sometimes I love our audience, right? I love our followers. They have so much humor. I mean, I love that there is a decent dose of, um, I said, Let's call it joking that we don't take the world too serious uh, uh, with what we're doing with our money, but that there's also a, a healthy dose of humor involved. I, I love yeah. it. They say dividend growth investing is boring, but that's no, 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 no. We, we dividend nerds. Uh, we have our own special humor. <laughs> okay, let's move on to some listeners' questions. Um, and the first one is from Div and Rockets, Dividends and Rockets. Would you invest in Real Madrid? if it were a dividend stock based on the success in the Champions League? 
No, because uh, I would really doubt the CEO there and how, how how things are being managed there and the balance sheet. It's not transparent, so I wouldn't invest in it. But yeah, it, it, this is where it comes to like a great business doesn't need to be a great stock. Yeah, yeah. Football clubs, particularly in England, generate a lot, a lot of money. Probably Real Madrid is probably up there with the English clubs. But I don't know. Other than Liverpool, that from a sentimental point of view, I would struggle to invest in that type of business. Yeah. Um, Centrino has said, if I'm not mistaken, Greenco UK announced a dividend cut. Um, I don't think that's correct. I think in 2023, they had a 10 cent dividend. So the yeah. fourth quarter was higher than the previous three. And then this is the first quarter and it's lower than the last quarter. And it's so two and a half, exactly yeah, it, it, it's, what 10 cents is about. It's two and a half. So it will be at least 10, 10 cent again. And yeah. then normally in the third or fourth quarter, they'll, based on inflation, as we mentioned, yeah. um, they will estimate what the dividend will be and the fourth quarter will typically be higher. Um, we got a question from, maybe pronounce that for me. You, you're good at German. Udelningskontakt. No, this is Scandinavian. Scandinavian, okay. Um, but the question is a good question. Has your perception about dividend growth investing changed from the start in any way? No, actually not. I mean, my knowledge has improved and therefore um, I, I, I kind of know better what I talk about right now. And I, of course, five years from now, I will again know better what I talk about because it's a learning journey. But my perception, no, I fell in love with it, and and yeah, now I'm married to it. Yeah, <laughs> so, but but I learned a lot, of course. What I learned, for instance, at a certain moment, you know, one of those things that I really had to learn, and I see that sometimes also when I interact with, for instance, our premium subscribers, uh, the premium plus, is it's about you're in the end buying income, growing income. And that's the mindset um, that I, yeah, that that became stronger and stronger. That that realization. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I think my perception has, I wouldn't say changed, has, has evolved. As in, there's more than one way to do this. Yes. You, you follow people online when you get started. You're inspired by by certain people, but actually, there's so many different types of companies. Different yeah. growth investing can be high yield, low yield. I, I look at decline of capitalists, for example. He has yeah. a a unique way of doing this. Alan is another one who has yeah. like a fund. There's so many ways of, of doing this. It's just about being comfortable in the types of companies, having a clear plan and, yeah. and sticking to it. So, and, and we are agreeing on a lot, but we're not buying the same stuff, which no, is very we, interesting, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you, I mean, you can have, it depends on your risk tolerance and on what, where you are in your journey. There's a, there's a but lot. Have you been buying Starbucks? No, I don't like. I, I've never exactly. really liked Starbucks. No, no, but BC. Yeah, that's so funny, right? Yeah, because because I, I never like you have strong conviction, and I never, I never saw that conviction. I, I suppose as a small retailer or as a small coffee shop owner back in the day, maybe I had a, a grudge against these large chain, but I never understood why you'd pay six, seven, eight, nine euro for a coffee when you can get a coffee which is probably better quality down the road for less than half the price. So. I, yeah, and it's interesting that you say, like, uh, who are you to judge about the quality? Because I found the Starbucks quality coffee always quite good. Yeah, but what but I, I say, it, it's usually more about taste because I don't know what we mean with quality. If I think about Starbucks, the shops, the supply chain, that's high quality there. So wh yeah. where does the quality come from? I think it's more about taste in the end. Yeah, yeah, that I, I, I can, I can give you that. But in terms of quality. I mean, you could have coffee snobs and we can get quite deep into the mechanics and technicals yeah. of, of, of yeah, coffee. Yeah, yeah. yeah, But there would be an argument out there, certainly in, in the courses that I have been to, that the mainstream coffee yeah. is generic and not as quality conscious as your small retailer. I mean, that's... Uh, and where that's does a small perception. retailer buy the coffee? Not in Ireland. Um, I mean, not... you don't have coffee beans growing in Ireland, right? <laughs> no, no, you don't. Oh, have, you exactly. don't have them. You don't have them. Ireland. Of course not. Of course not. Uh -huh. be, they, they would be quite funny beans that you'd be getting in Ireland. But look, I mean, you're right. Quality comes down to different things, and experts in the field might might argue differently with you. But yeah. 
in terms of price, you would get a, qual- a coffee that tastes just as nice, I would say, as Starbucks. Yeah, I, I, I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm teasing you a little bit. I, but I know, I know. But I think it's important because when people say quality, what are we really talking about? Because if you think about, it's the same with McDonald's. If you look at the supply chain of McDonald's and they're able already for, for so many years without a huge food poison to be able to operate at such a large scale, that, that's amazing. Yeah, that's really difficult. Imagine all the employees that you have as well. You just need to have one rogue employee that, that thinks like, I'm going to do something with these burgers. So that means they have really strong quality processes and such. Well, you can then, of course, talk again about the quality of the meat and, and, and such uh, here. Um, but but the coffee bean is a quite simple product from that point of view, right? And what I what I what I uh, where I can see the difference in, in 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 quality is if you go to such a coffee store where they are burning their own beans. Sometimes you have that, right? And then I think like, okay, the local coffee store really adds their own quality stuff to it. But if you just buy your bags of beans from a from an importer. Yeah, that's okay. Maybe we're going too far now into this uh, whole question. <laughs> maybe we should stop here. I, but all I want to say is, like, I think the pre the premium price you pay for Starbucks is really the experience, the ease of use, uh, using your app, walking in it, ready. Yeah, and I think they've been deteriorating a little bit this yeah. element of the brand uh, by losing focus. Yeah, but yeah. that's that's always why people pay premium, and that's why people love to work, walk over the street. Of a Starbucks uh, cup, because yeah. it gives you status, yeah. And and this is what what this is what Howard Schultz really nicely said. This experience needs to come back, yeah. Because otherwise, it becomes like a status symbol of this person is stupid, yeah. Why is this person paying so much money for a coffee? And that's the risk here with such a brand. Yeah, yeah. I I I see it a little differently, but it's it's as you said, the American consumer would be more think in the way you think in in this scenario so yeah i'm, I'm staying away shareholder <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm staying away i'm staying away from uh, right you are um yeah, yeah has asked us um or maybe asked you who are you supporting more in the eurovision poland or netherlands well first of all i find it really awkward that poland didn't get through the semi-finals i mean okay i didn't find that uh, luna's performance was good she was very poor but the uh, the song i really like the song the tower yeah it's for me a quality song let's say and i know when you say quality in the terms of your vision people always laugh but there every year out of the 30 songs or so there are always four or five high quality songs i thought that poland had one this year but seemingly not popular by the uh, audience. You need to hear it a few times as well, but then it starts really, it, it, it stays in my head, yeah? Yeah, and the Netherlands with Europapa is, of course, the the song at I the moment it. that is, I uh, yeah, it. yeah, I, I thought so. I mean, it's special, yeah? But then again, what's in the news now that he may get disqualified? Uh, you know, when people hear the podcast, we know what's, what really is the case. But uh, come on, man! If you have such a dream to be in the Eurovision, stay out of trouble, please. Yeah, stay out of trouble and don't yeah. create all this fuss. I I don't see him getting kicked out. I I I don't. But I hope not because I think the song is great. You mentioned it to me months ago, and it's been on my playlist in Spotify. My kids love it. Um, Euro <laughs> Papa. Um, I, I even try to sing some of the words, even though I just make it up as, as I go along. <laughs> <laughs> Um, David has asked me, um, what is my combined savings rate between pension and discretionary accounts as a percentage of total income? And do I contribute as an employee to a pension on top of employer? Um, so my savings rate is about 43% in total. And I only contribute to my employer's pension. So I put in X amount, they put in double. So I put in five, they put in 10%. Um, and that's that's all I do. Um, MM has asked us, um, the first request he's asked us is, can we change the name of the podcast to Competitive Dividend Talk? <laughs> Which is quite funny. <laughs> um, but he's asked about the trade desk, um, ticker symbol TTD. What's, maybe what's your thoughts on that? It doesn't pay a dividend. 
that's my thoughts so not interesting to me but I understand what he means um, um, this company is growing well good CEO so I understand that but that's more for me than in the context of being a quality compounder um, which is nice but I need a dividend. I need a growing dividend. So, and Miwash knows this, but you know he's the guy that always comes to me. EDJ Palantir, you know it's awesome. I'm I'm using this software in our company now. It's the best, and and you know he's right with all this stuff. Yeah, uh, when I see it, I think Palantir. I mean, I'm impressed with what the CEO of Palantir has been building up. I think it's really, really a great business. I've been looking at YouTube at this software. I know a little bit the space about uh, what's called data integration and everything, data streaming, data pipelines. And this is unique, what their software demonstrates. So I'm, I'm really blown away, actually, with what they are able to offer. Um, it's just not a dividend-paying stock. It's a high-growth stock, and it's hard for me to evaluate them and to understand, like, because that value is even more important what it's worth but uh, it's been doing it very well so kudos to him yeah i'd actually be interested to hear his thoughts on buyer at the moment ah, we are always making fun he, <laughs> he reached also out i think he sent an email to the investor relations about buyer like uh, it's just so funny but he, he and i are always making jokes and, and every time when there's something in the news we're looking at our holding and we're just laughing at each other it's my i mean it's like yeah it's it's kind of like uh laughing uh, out of making fun out of victims yeah <laughs> we are <laughs> yeah. the victims yeah 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 i, re I remember him pushing well, not pushing by but saying how un undervalued they were and, and telling me i should probably look into buying them at the time yeah um, yeah, yeah well so, we, uh, I, I don't think he would do that again it's a, it's a tough but he would in theory the business was was right it's just this monsanto monsanto's out there killing it yeah but in the end it's management that did all this yeah yeah, they bought it they overpaid for it and then also how they dealt with it so yeah. it's like a shit show um thomas k has asked us uh, about our opinion on record banking sir um and really about their current development so there's some legal action in the united states it's about a 60 million compensation package from an acquisition that they did which was me johnson and they are baby formula so i think some I think maybe some baby died prematurely based on their baby formula um so 60 million is not the end of the world in the grand scheme of things when you think of record bank and so but the problem here is that there is talks that there is going to be lots of other cases i mean if there's one case with baby formula i'm sure that there will be others that come up after it and it's that it's the unknown we've, we've seen this before we've seen it with a lot of companies i don't know how that case will go I seen on the investor relations, they are standing by it quite strongly. They believe that there's no issue with with that baby formula. But look, we don't know what the courts will take it. You can say you could say emotionally, if you go to court and a child is died linked to baby formula, it would be hard from an emotional level for someone to back a big company like that. So I think it's a little bit too early to tell. Um, just sit back and watch the share price dropped 15% you know, because of this and I can understand why and a lot of people were interested in the company because of that but at the moment I don't know is it another Monsanto it's too early to tell but I think until you have litigation sorted out I'm I'm staying away yeah uh, maybe it's after all not that safe while its products are all about safety yeah <laughs> um dividend gardner has asked us a few episodes back it was stated that kimberly clark wasn't attractive enough is sat a better european alternative so first of all i can't remember ever having looked in sat so i looked it up and i saw growing dividends so it made me happy and i also saw decent dividend return so you know what and also if i looked at some of the products it it just may be yeah so I, I, I actually this was for me the highlight of this uh, podcast that i discovered a new stock that i put on my list that i want to explore <laughs> i know it's in sweden i know what people say about the tax rate and da -de -da -de -da, but it 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 it, it woke up uh, some fire in me so uh, thank you 
um, it, David and Gardner. Uh, also, feel free to reach out and let me know what you think about this talk. Uh, it may save me some time uh, by by getting some pointers where to look at. But uh, yeah, nice one. I'm going to look into it. I mean, people can't see our face, but uh, you look so excited. And when when we were looking, we just kind of browsed through the questions just before we went on air. And usually we take like 30 seconds and we and we look at them. But you cop this company and you were so happy. You were, and I'm like, man, they just sell tissues. What are you so excited for? <laughs> <laughs> but you were so happy talking about them. So uh, one of those one of those companies. But look, you know what you got to do. You got to you got to do it. exactly. I got to do it. You got to do stock car from those guys. Um, we got a question from Old Madge MTG, and he's asking you, have have you continued to track what I believe you called your biggest mistake, General Electric? Yes. So they have a really great CEO, and I sold them at around uh, fifty dollars my last uh, tranche, and it's now at hundred sixty dollars. Like literally, the moment when I bought uh, sold my last shares. The stock started lifting off and it quadrupled. Now, how do you think I feel? I don't want to hear any questions anymore about General Electric. <laughs> I mean... Just keep it out of the show. It's bloody annoying. <laughs> I had this stock for like six, seven years in my portfolio. It was I was really a back holder there. Always think like maybe it comes back. Maybe it's coming. Oh, the CEO is really great, but I have a certain amount of fault. Like, okay, it's about opportunity cost. Yeah, at least I got now dividends in return for that money. But yeah, let's move on. Next question. <laughs> you went from having the biggest smile on your face to, to having it wiped straight off you. One question after another. Love it. Um, <laughs> Martin has asked us, is the strategy to always sell a stock when a dividend is uh, Mintaren. Mintaren. Mintaren, sometimes a bad decision? Of course. Yeah, that's what we often say, right? We 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 don't necessarily cut. We uh, sell after a cut. I do it in 90% of the cases, but I didn't do it after the shell cut. I didn't do it after the, the known cut. I really look at like what's the reason, what is the future prospect of the of the business and the dividend. But most of the time, I end up selling it. Yeah, yeah, it depends. I I think we've we've said this before. It's case by case. Yeah, um, usually if. Yeah, usually there's good indicators if it's a red flag or sometimes yeah. the business just needs to do it. So uh, look, look, you know, you could argue Shell cut the dividends, yeah, but there was a good story the, uh, from the CEO behind it. There was a good reason. We all knew it. The CEO didn't be there around the bush, but then look at 3M. Everyone yeah. knows it. Everyone sees it. And then how the management is dealing with it and communicated about it. Then I think like, no, you don't want there's no yeah no yeah, yeah. Um, Digital Needle asked us about our thoughts on the Paramount saga so I, I if he if he refers to Warren Buffett uh, here as, as calling it out that this is one of the biggest mistakes I mean look it just shows that he's human and, and, and that's really my opinion for the rest I'm not so interested in Paramount as a as a company it also shows that you should not borrow conviction and not just buy something because the great Warren Buffett buys it. Exactly, exactly. Quite important. And the last question of the day goes to, my eyes will see the glory. <laughs> 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 what are your thoughts on Abbott lab lab uh, Laboratories? Yeah, I mean, an amazing company. Um, and and that day one spun off, Abfi has made many shareholders rich. If you combine the Ab Abbott and the app dividend together and you see the growth it's a stellar growth story um, i mean about solid company it's doing a good job i find them a bit better than medtech and yeah, th those are my thoughts uh, of course not not any investment advice here yeah yeah as you said solid company made a lot of people rich with with Abby. imagine getting the spin-off and getting Abby for free oh yeah nice nice anyway that is the end of the show um, thanks a million, Tim, for the inspiration behind this. Um, we try to be diversified and give different tickers where where we could. Um, so we hope you enjoyed the show, and we will see you all next week. Remember, both of us at Dividend Talk are not certified financial specialists through formal education. 
We are just two guys sharing our journey for inspiration and entertainment purposes. Hence, this is not investment advice. Although we do our best, we can't promise that the information discussed is always correct, nor appropriate for you or anybody else. We always recommend that you do your own due diligence and be accountable for your own choices. As we always say, you can't borrow conviction from others. Last but not least, by listening to our podcast, you agree to hold us harmless from any ramifications financial or otherwise that occur to you as a result of acting on information provided in this podcast.